Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. So as we get started this morning, virtual breakfast is every Thursday morning during the growing season. We're glad you're here, and we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Kim Cassida. She is our forage and cover crop specialist for MSU. And Kim, you've got some exciting information. Alfalfa and forages are always exciting, but this is even more exciting. And I'm gonna have you go ahead and get started. Take it away, please. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can all see a picture of alfalfa growing. Phil and I have been talking for some time now about how our weather patterns are changing and whether that might be affecting what we could consider as our best planting dates uh, in the fall, particularly for alfalfa. So um, I, we decided to look into that a little bit for our talk today. So to begin with, I just want to talk about how alfalfa grows. Uh, obviously, you plant a seed. Um, it needs to take up water from the soil. It will first form a root that you don't see, followed by the cotyledons uh, poking up through the ground. Then you'll get that unifoliate leaf. Usually um, within under good conditions, you know, you'll have that unifoliate leaf up within a week, usually, uh, followed by your first trifoliate leaf and, and from there on. Um, and it's important to remember that the crown is developing at the same time. This is uh, really the key thing that affects when we need to plant it in the fall, because the crown of the alfalfa initially, when that seedling is developed, developing, it's above the ground. And that crown is sensitive to uh, temperature. So if it is above ground when you get your first uh, hard freeze, it's likely to kill it. But fortunately, alfalfa exhibits something we call contractile growth. Um, and that causes it to pull the crown underground. So you can see the difference between these two pictures here. Here our crown is still above ground and here it has pulled down below about usually, if it's at least an eighth of an inch below the ground, it's usually pretty safe from frost. It will, it can get up to a half an inch down. Uh, and typically that is happening when you actually have multiple shoots. And you can also feel it if you pull up a ceiling, you can feel a little knot right there. And so the key thing there is that that needs to, uh, to happen before the freeze. And it takes at least six weeks for the plant to do that. Under good growing conditions, six weeks is how long it takes to get to that point. And so traditionally, that has been um, the selling point for deciding how early in uh, that late summer planting window we have to plant our alfalfa. But when we plant alfalfa, typically we have two planting windows we can look at. We have a spring planting window, um, which of course is well past, um, which most people try and hit. The, the difference we see with the spring window is that um, it gives us the advantage of that we may be able to get a cutting or two in our seeding year. Um, but when we plant early, we are going to see more weeds, more insects, more diseases. Um, that we have to deal with through that growing season. We do have the advantage usually that we have more water availability. So that can be a helpful thing in getting those plants going. Then we have a fall planting window, which traditionally has been um, for the Northern half of the state has been uh, before August 1st, from about July 20th to August 1st. And for the Southern part of the state, we would want people to have the alfalfa in the ground by the 15th of August. So the advantage there is that you have um, fewer pests, less weeds, less insects, less disease, but we always have the risk that we're going to have not enough water. Um, we, we seem to be in a trend where that late summer period often has uh, a dry spell in it. And when you put the seeds into dry soil, they're not going to do anything. Or even worse, if you put them into dry soil, they get a little bit of rain, just enough to germinate, um, and then nothing, um, they can actually not make it through to the, to the next rain. Now, people uh, wonder about yield for the alfalfa stand from a spring versus a, a fall cutting or seeding. And I looked at our variety test results over a 17 year period where, uh, you know, it just depends on the year. Sometimes our tests are planted in the spring and sometimes in the fall, depending on conditions. Um, and when I looked at the 
three year production year total over that 17 years, there really was no difference in total stand yield for, for a spring versus a fall cutting. So the main difference is the convenience of, of when you want to do that. But our biggest risk factors are, are A, is it going to be too dry planting? Secondly, what is the weather going to be like um, that fall? Because we need that six weeks of time at least before our first freeze. So I went to the Midwest Climate Center and pulled up some of their, their maps for freeze dates. So a, a freeze, a hard freeze is defined as 28 degrees, and that's usually what it takes to kill alfalfa or, or damage it. Our earliest recorded freezes across Michigan are shown here on the left. So you can see that most of the state in this graph is blue, and that is uh, going to be our September dates. If you look at what's our best case scenario for the latest recorded freeze, most of the state is falling in November or late October. Um, that's a pretty big range, month range of, uh, of when that freeze might occur. And of course, when you're trying to plant before something, you never know when that is going to be. So um, one compromise might be to look at the median date, and that would be the, the date in between the earliest and the latest. And that's what our middle chart is showing. Um, and here you can see that most of the state is in the green, which is um, going to be October. So what does this mean um, in accordance to our previous recommendations for alfalfa? Um, here's just the date of that median hard freeze. Um, on the left, we have the averages for the 1981 to 2010 30 year period, uh, which was just recently update updated um, to 1991 to 2020, because we're always looking at the last 30 years as being a good indicator of the average um, that we are currently dealing with. And if you compare these two from the old norms to the new norms, you can see that um, our traditional cold spot in the middle of the northern lower peninsula has gotten a little smaller right here. Um, we have a new cold spot that is uh, popped up in the uh, western UP, uh, but most of the rest of the state is actually the date of that first freeze has moved back. So um, it is warmer a little bit longer into the fall. How could we relate this to our uh, recommendations for planting? This is that uh, chart from the right um, in that last slide. And this line that I've drawn across right here is our traditional cutoff for planting. If you look at the alfalfa management guide that's published by a number of extension um, groups across the country, um, here's that line that we used, we used to draw across Michigan. So if you were north of this line, you should have your alfalfa in by August 1st. If you're south of the line, you should have it in by the 15th. And then compare that to the actual zones of when the freeze actually happens in Michigan. It's always been difficult to draw a straight line across Michigan because the lake influence gives us so many different microclimates. So <clears throat> I have taken um, our timings based on that median date of first freeze and adjusted the window for when to do that late summer uh, planting of alfalfa. So in our first three zones here, I'm, you know, start planting at about the same time as we always have around July 20th. If you plant too early, um, you still have weed pressure and too much risk of hot, dry weather. Uh, but you can push it forward a little bit in the north, so up to August 5th, maybe, in these cold spots. Um, and then just pushing it forward five, uh, 10 days at a time for these next two uh, green regions, dark green and, and medium green, you can get up to August 25th. Um, if you are in the light green or the brown regions, I'm taking a general cutoff of Labor Day. That is less, more than six weeks. Uh, but what happens in the spring 
when the days are getting shorter and it is getting cooler, even if it's not freezing, um, everything grows slower in the fall. So the farther in you get into this period, the more time you have to give the alfalfa to get to um, putting the crown underground. A longer interval out here. And Labor Day is a nice number. It's a nice date that everyone can remember to say, here's where you need to cut that off. Um, remember that here in this window, um, you need to plant as early as possible, as long as you do have soil moisture, all right? Putting the seed into the ground when there is no soil moisture, best case scenario is that it's just gonna sit there and wait for it to rain. Um, but this is, Imagine, and I've had this happen to us a number of times recently with, with plantings with the pattern we've been in. You plant the seed, it sits there for two weeks before it comes up, before there's enough moisture, all right? But you have to start counting your six weeks from when it comes up, not from when you planted it. If, you're, if your seed just sat in the dust for weeks before it started growing, um, it's not making any progress towards um, getting its, itself ready for winter. So <clears throat> you just need to uh, consider that a little bit. We do see that if you plant earlier in the window, research has shown that that will affect your yield the following year. It's the same thing as we see with many crops like wheat. The earlier you can get it planted in your, in your possible window, the better your yields are likely to be um, in that second year, given that conditions are good. So we have the question also about what about other forages? Um, closed, and I'm talking about our perennials here. So if we have our perennial red and white clovers or bird's foot trefoil or our perennial forage grasses, uh, what kind of timing do we need for those? Uh, so I looked through the recommendations for that and those plants all, also require about six weeks of uh, of growth in order to get the root or the crown ready for winter. So I think the easiest thing to uh, to do is to just use the same planting window as alfalfa um, as your rule of thumb, okay, to get those going. You should see all of your legumes have a crown uh, formed before that freeze comes and your grasses should have multiple tillers on them. Now, Phil and I were talking just before we let everyone into the into the program this morning, how both of us have experienced that in many cases, you can actually plant forage grasses um, quite a bit later than Labor Day with success. Uh, but I think the thing to remember is that you can have exceptions where it might work, but the later you get into the fall, uh, the riskier that becomes. So the Labor Day is still a nice safe cutoff, but um, you can uh, sometimes get away with later. I've planted perennial forages as late as the end of September um, and had, had it work, but that might be pushing the envelope a little bit. So with that, I'm going to um, close and stop my sharing. Let me ask well one quick question before before you go on, Kim. Uh, okay. Is there a certain height that alfalfa will reach uh, when it starts to pull that crown below the surface, six, eight, ten inches tall? I know it depending on good growing conditions. Have you ever it depends quantified on, that? But typically, it's starting to pull when you start to see multiple shoots on the seedling. That's when it's starting to pull down. Oh, as long as you've still got just one shoot coming out, you're not there yet. Um, and, you know, I've seen very short alfalfa with multiple shoots on it. And, uh, you know, under good conditions, it may be taller. So I think that the number of shoots is a better indicator than um, the height. Great. All right. Thank you, Kim. At this time, if there are any questions, please go ahead and post those into the chat. But Kim, I have a question for you about problems with fall seedings. What would happen if we have a fall where we do have some early frost? Would we see that uh, affecting the alfalfa in the fall or would that show up later on in the springtime? Well, typically with the new seedlings, it's going to affect them pretty quickly. So, you know, if they still have uh, that crown above ground and you get a hard freeze, that's why we don't talk about the 32 degrees for damaging our seedlings. It really takes, you know, more than a light frost that, you know, it 
the 32 degrees will take out your tomatoes and a lot of things. But to really freeze that crown, we need to get down to that hard freeze temperature of 28. Um, and you would see that pretty quickly if those little seedlings are being damaged. Um, but it is also possible that some of them would just be weakened, I suppose, and that you wouldn't actually see them disappear until the spring because then they'd have additional stress through the winter that would um, cause them to finally give up the ghost. All right. Thank you, Kim. <clears throat> I don't see a lot of questions today in the chat, but I do want to open it up and ask our other specialists that may be on today if they have uh, something that they would like to to add. I know that Dr. Marty Chilvers is on and Marty, you were missed the last couple of weeks as we talked about tar spot and the conditions that that uh, is rearing up. Can you give us an update on tar spot? Is yeah, that, hey Phil, everybody. Um, yeah, so tar spot, uh, just in general, I guess, um, corn disease pressure and soybean disease pressure is pretty light. Uh, and I'm talking primarily there about foliar diseases. Um, in terms of corn, uh, we've, we've got confirmations now of tar spot in around about um, five counties. Um, but those confirmations, and one just came in yesterday for Ingham County, but it was like one lesion that was found in a field. So very, very light levels of disease. <clears throat> contrast that to last year and everyone's freaked out about tar spot because of last year. I've got to remember how wet it was, uh, how many, you know, how much leaf wetness hours we were accumulating last year. That really drove disease. And we last year we found, easily found disease um, on the 1st of July. And this year, you know, it really hasn't been until this last week or so for the most part. And even then it's pretty light levels. So it's a very, very different situation in terms of the amount of uh, pressure that's out there. Um, other diseases, we have a little bit of common rust, a little bit of northern leaf spot, and a little bit of gray leaf, um, um, gray leaf blight. Um, and some of those may even be confused with um, tar spot at the very onset. There are other black spots on leaves. So if you're not sure, please um, send in a sample of the diagnostic clinic. I'll put my contact details in there too. You're welcome to um, you know, text, email me images. I'm happy to look at those. But yeah, tar spots, very, very light pressure. Um, my students have also been finding, uh, just on the soybean front now, in terms of white mold management, uh, have been finding apothecia out there the last couple of weeks. So, you know, if you're in a field with risk, um, there probably are apothecia out there and some of these moisture events will help um, bring additional flushes potentially. So Marty, some of the producers in my area have had a delay as far as tasseling is concerned or were planted later. And if they're considering an application of fungicide, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, so there's a few factors here to think about, right? So I think one of the really big challenges, just the bigger picture here, is that, you know, typically we're relying on one fungicide application, maybe two, to protect, you know, that green leaf area for the duration of the season. Thankfully, this season, you know, there's very, very little disease, so we haven't had to protect against much. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of making a fungicide application and return on investment? If we have high disease pressure like we did last year, your chance of return on investment and the size of that increases dramatically um, compared to this year. There still may be a yield advantage for putting a fungicide um, or yield protection, but it's going to be far less than last year. So in terms of the timing for tar spot, if we're just thinking about tar spot management, most of the vegetative applications are gonna to be too early for tar spot in most years, including last year, where we had high pressure early in the season. Generally, I would say as a you know, rule of thumb, we are looking at somewhere between that R1 through to R3 um, growth stages for fungicide application for the management of tar spot. However, there are, have, have been situations where um, later applications into R4 maybe even approaching R5, um, could be warranted if disease actually does pick up late in the season. 
Um, Jeff's longer range forecast there is still sort of showing dry conditions. So I don't really know how much disease we're actually going to pick up. Um, so I would be holding onto those fungicide applications. And, it, you know, the other factor is, are we trying to manage ear molds? If so, yeah, you want to apply those at green silk. But if, you know, if task one again is the primary um, target, then we would want to be delaying those fungicide applications. Thanks so much. Marty. Kim, we have a question uh, that came into the chat from Paul. Is there a period of time it has to stay below 28 degrees before damage occurs to the alfalfa? Yeah, in growth chamber trials, we find that it takes about four hours at 28 degrees or below to uh, thoroughly toast those crowns. So, um, but the, the colder the soil is, the quicker you can get to that point so it's um it it's takes a more than target yeah it's a, a moving bit. target yeah a little bit okay and, and uh, just to follow up on that kim and, and phil that four hours at 28 degrees for a transitional period that's a that's a really hard freeze mm -hmm. for uh, for that time of the year so that's not mm -hmm. that's not your your run-of-the-mill frost on the top but uh, th right that's a, yeah that's a real that's a real hard freeze Yep. And I want to make clear, I mentioned this when I was talking before, but I want to say it again. That's why when we're when we're talking about a freeze on alfalfa, we're talking about a freeze. A we're not talking frost. about, yeah, we're not talking about, oh, there's a little touch of frost on the corn. It has to be frozen. <laughs> All right. Thanks so for that that's clarification. Why, that's why we can, um, you know, we can kind of look at that median date that I'm looking at is like that means 50% of the time the freeze came earlier 50% of the time it came later but you can be a little take a little bit more risk um, on going later into the fall because you know we know that that light frost is probably going to come earlier um, but that's not what we're talking about we're looking for that really hard freeze. Kim a question from Leon uh about forage yield during this dry weather, are we better off cutting our grassy fields and hoping more moisture will cause growth? Or should we cut what little there is and hope for a later good cutting? Well, that's very much an it depends question. I mean, to me, I'm sorry, I was Oops. muted there. Um, that's an it depends question. Uh, to me, when you're anytime you're looking at a hay field that's marginal and wondering if you should cut or not, cut it or not, you have to think about what is the cost of cutting it. You know, if I usually figure that on a hay field, we need to be getting at least a half a ton an acre in order to just pay for running the equipment over it. Um, you know, and higher value hay, and and that's when we're talking about a high value hay. If it's a low value hay. Maybe you just leave it. It's not going to make much difference to the grass, whether you cut it or not. Um, it's going to grow back from this rain. So, you know, if it was worth it to you to get that little bit of yield that's there now, um, you could take it or it would, that yield will still be there added into the new growth if you wait until you get some, some rebound from this rain. I guess it All depends right. on how bad do you need that hay right now. <laughs> So there's another question that came in for, for Marty. Marty, could you tell us uh, the differences between ground or air application for a fungicide? Sure. Uh, and again, we're probably focused more on task bite here. Um, I don't think there's going to be a great deal of difference between um, application methods for control of task bite. Um, I've seen great control with both a ground rig and an aerial application. As long as the applications are being made, you know, with best practices, it should be fine, either, either method. Okay, terrific. And from Eric, are the historical first medium last freezing dates based on a hard freeze, uh, the 28 degrees for four hours that we just talked about, or just when it gets down to 28 degrees? And I can take that one. It's, it's the latter. Uh, it, to get that 32 or, uh, or, and remember another issue, which is relevant here, is that the measurement's taken at five feet above the ground level. So it's likely going to be cooler or colder at the ground surface itself. But what those statistics reflect is what happens at five 
feet above the ground and it only has to happen instantaneously. If we get a 28, that's going to count. Um, and it, so to get four, four hours of 28 or lower, you likely probably had colder temperatures than, than 28 uh, physically present there at the time. But it's, it's, it doesn't have to be there for any threshold. It's, it's, if, if it meets that, that's, that's officially what goes on the record. Good information. Uh, I see that uh, Dennis Pennington has posted some information. Dennis, are you still on? Yep. You want to share what you have for us? Sure. Uh, we just finished up the week performance trial results uh, yesterday, and I shipped the, that report off to Michigan Farm Bureau. Um, it'll be printed in their Michigan Farm News August 15th edition. Um, it is already on the um, the Week Checkoff Program's website at miweek.org in the What's Hot column or what, What's Hot box there. Um, and it will be posted on the MSU Variety Trial webpage uh, later today, I hope, um, if I can get get the webmaster to, to get it posted for me. So um, if anybody wants a copy of that, email directly to them, email me. Um, for some reason, when I type my email in there, it like put part of it on one line and part of it on the next line, but it's pennant 34 at msu.edu. Um, if anybody wants a copy of it right now, send me an email and I'll respond and attach the report uh, directly to that. All right, thanks so much, Dennis. And would you say that the yields were above average or below average this year? It depends on the location. We had two sites that uh, were above average and we had four sites that were below average. So yeah. overall, we're going to be a trend yield at best. We have some farms that are having good yields and some that are disappointed with their yields. So all depends on rain makes green, right? Yes. All right. Uh, I see that uh, Manny Singh is on. Manny, I have a question for you about these rains that we're receiving now. Uh, what effect or what's the impact of these rains on our corn yields especially? Uh, soybeans always re respond well in August to moisture, but what about the corn? Is it too late for some of these corn fields? Oh, hey, Phil. Uh, so, yeah, I think as you mentioned, I mean, it's going to be pretty good for soybeans. Uh, we talked, I think, a few weeks ago in our Hot Topic Q&A that uh, the crops were hurting, probably corn more so than, than, than soybean because of where they were in terms of growth stages, right? Soybeans, we see we have a lot of planting date studies here on campus and uh, uh, some of the early planted are already uh, setting seed and uh, they are in that R5 stage, which is pretty critical uh, for, for uh, optimal moisture, right? So I think soybeans will actually benefit probably more uh, with this uh, incoming moisture uh, just before that uh, seed fill uh, starts to happen, right? For corn, uh, again, I mean, uh, we are mostly uh, done uh, pollinating here, right? Uh, we had some late planted trials uh, into early June, uh, and that's where we are still seeing like some silking uh, and pollination still going on. But for the most part, uh, I think we are done. Even the USDA report was up to 80% or so uh, last Monday, uh, if not higher. So again, if there was a lack of moisture during pollination, uh, that silking uh, period, that will hurt uh, against successful pollination. But I think we were not, again, except uh, maybe some locations, we were not really hurting on, on moisture and I expect pollination probably to be okay. And as long as that's the case, this, this moisture will, will benefit us, right? Because even pollination success is one thing and then you still have to, to start filling those uh, kernels, right? And that's where this moisture is, is going to come into, into play. Otherwise, you do the pollination, the ovule is fertilized, but it's gonna end up aborted, right? Because there's lack of incoming nutrients, you know, with the lack of moisture. So I think this rain will, will benefit uh, quite quite a bit, especially the areas that were getting uh, more, more dry, if that makes sense. And there's again, there's implications on the disease uh, side of things that I assume Marty already talked about. Very good, thank you so much, Manny. I see that, uh, Dr. Chris Defonso has entered something into the chat. Chris, you want to share what you're, uh, what you're finding on Western bean cutworms? Yep. Uh, for those who have trapped reliably, meaning that they've trapped through July and, and entered their counts on a weekly basis, 
and and then they they've recently entered that trend is going down so it looks like the the moth counts are trending down which is what should be happening at this time of the year and this week and next are probably the sweet spot to stay to spray dry beans where you've had you know counts over 120 or 150 in in a bucket for corn again you have to actually scout to see if they're even there because of the tide to the uh, to the to the crop stage. So I, I think when when you go in and look at some of these moth counts, you know a lot of people have entered just one day or two 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 weeks. And if you're going to trap, you really have to start at the beginning and carry through for six, seven, eight weeks because that shows you when the peak happens and, and, that, and that's what you're looking for. So the, the utility of trapping just for a week or two, that's not really worth your time. What you really need to be doing is trapping for six to eight weeks to show the trend of the, of the flight. And, and we've got a number of sites doing that. All right, thanks so much, Chris. Are there any other specialists on that wanted to add a comment or two of what's going on in their field of expertise? Well, hearing none, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, great program today. Uh, very good presentations, good information. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, everyone, for joining the virtual breakfast. Uh, join us next week when Dr. Hassan Ghani will talk about uh, the effect of tile and removing water quickly and how, how that can affect yield. So thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.